My name is Will Chu. I'm a professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering. I'm also a fellow in the Precourt Institute. And uh, now for the next hour, uh, Yi Tui and myself will give an overview on the energy storage activities at Stanford. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my colleague Yi. And uh, he's a very prolific scientist uh, in three ways. Uh, the first is his scientific contributions. Uh, I don't have to go into his metrics, but his uh, uh, the most cited material scientist uh, worldwide and one of the most cited scientists worldwide. In terms of mentorships, he has uh, produced uh, countless graduates. About 100 of them are now in uh, academia worldwide as professors and scientists elsewhere. And then also in terms of innovation, he has started, I think, four companies, right? Or five? Or more to come? Three! Three! Okay. <laughs> So one more is in the making. Uh, and uh, E is a true pillar of the energy research community at Stanford, uh, focusing on many aspects. And today, he will tell us about uh, what's going on in the energy storage space. E, please. Well, thank you, Will. Now you see my younger colleague, how he uh, set up the expectation for the senior colleague to move forward. I would like to start by. Uh, Welcoming you to Stanford. This is uh, the best place in the world. <laughs> Simply saying that. Uh, Will and I are going to spend the next hour also to introduce to you the activity, research activity at Stanford related to energy storage. I believe some of you come to Stanford interested in energy. Energy storage, you know, it's very, very important. This is the central piece of that, right? The way to store energy becomes the very important link in the whole energy landscape. Um, whether it could enable the electrical cars or store solar and wind electricity to help stabilizing the grid. And uh, you know, from the portable electronics you already have personal experience on, this is very, very important topic. I want to start by introducing Storage X initiative to you. This is a new initiative at Stanford right here. Uh, Professor Chu and I are the co-directors uh, of this initiative with the help uh, of Jimmy Chen in the back. Uh, we are really putting a lot of time for a reason because it's very important. So in these technology areas, and there's uh, a number of grand challenges the whole Stanford research community try to address. You know, developing the, for example, the battery technology, the low cost, very safe, long lifetime, and so on. And also, how do we understand and address the challenges of scale in manufacturing? Sometimes you think about this is the problem industry should be doing. But when you look into deeper, the science of scaling in manufacturing is not clear. We need to work on those. And uh, how, do, how do we do the you know, energy storage, reuse, recycle, and regeneration? And this represents a very exciting, very exciting opportunity with the batteries, for example. You know, you take back from the electrical car, how do you better utilize the, that batteries? After it's a first life, can you inject a second life or even the third life? of the batteries. And uh, with AI, artificial intelligence, all these new tools right there, how do you predict? How do you diagnostic? Doing diagnostics of the life, the health condition of your energy storage. And this really provides big opportunity right there. Let's, now let's look at Stanford. We actually has a large number of faculties by now working related to storage. And this is the plot we would like to use. This is the land scale. This is the time scale. You look at this, right? Going from, let's say, femtosecond, picosecond, all the way to years, we need to care about what's happening. You know, years is the battery life. Fundamental process, electrons moving. You're talking about picosecond or faster time scale. And from the atomic structure, angstrom scale all the way to meter scale, scale in the system level. These are many scientific engineering uh, questions we could work on. So this is timely, it's this year. 
we want to initiate these uh, very important research areas. So we will have a kickoff meeting on October 17th to of officially launch this initiative under the support of Prico Institute. So, well, let's look at, you know, some of the very important perspective right here. Usually academia, we are doing research on this fundamental understanding, but industry is doing you know, prototype scale up manufacturing. So these uh, years of research in these areas, we, we find out there's a missing gap right there. So we hope using Storage X, we can address this missing gap to do pre-competitive you know, translational type of research in addition to the existing strength already on the fundamental research here at Stanford. So that's the key idea uh, of this initiative. So next, uh, about 25 minutes also, I want to introduce you to my own group research and giving you a little bit of detailed look. After that, Professor Chen will be talking about his own research, also giving you you know, very different type of ideas, but very, very exciting one. I wish I were a graduate student another time, you know, I could join his research group, <laughs> and, but it's probably too late for me to do so. Um, so let me give you an overview of what's happening in my lab. I've been at Stanford for about 14 years now. Um, I still remember hiring my first graduate student working on energy storage. At the time, I didn't know much about energy storage. But 14 years passed, right? Let me list some of the grand challenges in the, in the energy storage and the battery-related research. What we want to do, we want to increase energy density, the amount of energy you store per unit weight or volume uh, by a lot. We want to double, we want to triple. How do we do that? We want to answer this question. How do we extend the battery life by three times or more? Life means charging, discharging cycle life. It also means the calendar life. Instead of seven, eight years, can you go to 30 years of calendar life? That means very different impact to the whole society. And how fast can we charge up the batteries? Every one of you would like to have your phone charged up within five minutes, right? I would say, well, let's see if we can do our car within 10 minutes. That would be amazing. That would just like, you know, filling the gas tank type of time scale. And uh, can we make the batteries completely safe? Never worry about catching fire or the uh, explosion. Uh, can, we, can we reduce the cost by three times? If it's three times, that's, that's done, you know, for the electric car, right? The cost will be really, really low for the electric car. Very, very competitive. So battery reuse and recycle, how do we do grid scale seasonal storage? I mean, all these questions, each one of these questions is very, very big. If you have great ideas, giving answers to one question, I think you, are, you, are, you will be doing really well at Stanford. So everybody will know you for sure. I will know you for sure. <laughs> So this is the uh, overall research program I set up in my lab. So some of them is for addressing the question of how do you get to high energy? You know, how do you do the safety? How do you do the grid scale? How do you understand what's happening inside the battery? Now let me pick a few examples to share with you. The first one, this is the one I uh, really like. Uh, I've been working on this really right at the beginning when I joined the faculty. You know, high energy density of batteries, how high can it go? Um, it comes back to the very simple, you know, uh, understanding or equation, basically, you know, general chemistry. So let's use lithium as an example. In order to increase the energy density, you want to store a lot more charges. That's lithium ions. So this is current technology using all these materials. This is the plot we made. It's the atomic ratio of lithium to the host material structure. We only utilize one lithium per six atoms, roughly, the host material. So you actually have heavy weight, big volume. But lithium coming in and out, the relative volume change of this material is very small. You are talking about right here nearly zero, but it's not zero, it's about 10% or less. And your cell phone, your laptop, your electric cars, they are using these materials. To store more energy, 
you have to increase the ratio of lithium versus the host material until this is uh, virtually infinite because this is metallic lithium. You don't have any host atoms right there. But the volume expansion, volume change in the relative sense is infinite. So it becomes harder and harder and harder using new materials. Uh, but if you could make this happen, this is current technology using graphite to get lithium in and out with this lithium metal oxide right there. This is somewhere you get to 250, 260 watt per kilogram. That's what's in the Tesla car, the amount of energy you store per unit weight. If you can use a new chemistry such as silicon anode to work, lithium metal anode, lithium sulfur, and so on, you could you know, keep advancing this amount of energy. If you can get here 500 watt per kilo, this is the equivalent to one charge per charge of your electrical car with a reasonable size of the battery pack. Your car will run 500 miles. Remember this number, 500 watt per kilo, 500 miles. That's where we want to go to. So the past number of years, we look at silicon, for example. That could store a lot of charges, but volume expansion and braking you know, cause the problem. We start to design using nanotechnology to solve those problems. This is the paper we published back in 2008 um, using silicon nanowires to take in a lot of lithium, 10 times more than graphite. And we has the breaking problem. It has many issues showing up by using this nanotechnology design. We were able to overcome the breaking problem. So uh, uh, fast forward, we have been through 12 generations of design to solve instability of the interface issue and, and so on. Uh, along this process, actually students are very important. And each one of this generation, I will develop a, one student and become the academia superstar. And some of them are professors you know, here in the US and also around the world right now. That's a process of development, development of research and developing people uh, in parallel. Um, and Stanford right here in Silicon Valley, it's very hard not to start our company. So uh, as Bill mentioned, so here we, I did. <laughs> uh, this is Amplius. I first company I started to work on Silicon Anno. Uh, I can tell you it's very, very hard to commercialize a technology. So $150 million so far has been put in. And uh, the outcome is you now having these batteries, energy density is quite high. Uh, instead of 250, now you have 300, uh, 430. And supplying to the Airbus Cyphers S, this is commercial drone flying the sky, 70,000 feet elevation. Continue in flying 25 days, no stopping. So you don't need to really ever need to go to the ground to charge. This use uh, solar cells right here on the wind, but require very high energy density batteries to power. Otherwise, this. Uh, drone cannot take off. Um, so this is an example of a high energy. So what's going further is uh, we need to go to 500 watt per kilo. We have to work on materials such as metallic lithium. This is a half a century old problem. In 1980s, there, there are people trying to get metallic lithium to work. But metallic lithium has so many problems. A notorious problem is during battery charging. And it grow out this dendrite. This dendrite cause shorting and battery catching fire and explode. In 1980s, one company startup commercialized the lithium metal anode technology. And a few months later, the battery catch fire, the you know, company was gone. And nobody wanted to touch metallic lithium since. But we are running out of the capacity. We have to work on this. Uh, so at Stanford right here, we have quite a bit of activity try to solve this problem. Um, so I won't go into the detail, just to show you we have a team uh, consisting of uh, pre previous Secretary of Energy, Professor Steve Chu, and Professor Bao in chemical engineering right there, designing the you know, new materials to work on this problem. So let me just give you, you know, one or two very simple idea, but actually turned out to be uh, uh, might be very important for the whole research field. Because lithium metal can grow this uh, dendritic structure, then how do you really control its plating behavior during the battery charging? 
And 2016, we come up with the idea, we say, well, let's design a host material to host lithium plating. We made this a hollow carbon structure, and, and the uh, size diameter is about a few hundred nanometer with this gold nanoparticle seeds in there. It doesn't need to be gold, it can be low cost other metals, seeding the growth of metallic lithium. If you play lithium, lithium goes in, and then you can isolate lithium metal from the electrolyte and contain metallic lithium in there. We actually made this structure. Let me show you a in situ uh, electron microscopy uh, video. Here at Stanford, we have these uh, beautiful tools, right? They're so important. Um, you can charge and discharge the battery inside electron microscope to see what's happening. Um, this is the video. We have hollow carbon right here. This is gold nanoparticle. Now we put lithium in. You can see gold function as the, as the seeds, and, and it actually get dissolved away in metallic lithium and promote the lithium deposition going inside of this hollow carbon sphere instead of outside. So using an idea like this, we can really understand how the lithium plating is taking place. Once lithium gets extracted out, you know, this gold particle comes, comes, comes back. A structure like this with a new host, we could now stabilize uh, metallic lithium deposition a lot more. Uh, this other host design, for example, using graphene oxide. Let me jump through this. I, I don't have to uh, show you all the video uh, for the time consideration. Let me show you another example going on in the group and also uh, quite broadly right, right now. You know, uh, uh, Will and I and a few other faculties, we team up try to address the challenges of the battery fast charging. We want to see whether we can go below 15 minutes. You know, if we can go to 10, that will be even better. But it's a really hard problem. It's a really, really challenging problem. You know, for the first year graduate student coming in, you guys have, will have five years probably to work on this problem. That's, that should be very exciting. I have 20, 30 years right here, keep working on this problem. I hope some of you can join me to be you know, part of it. Right? So let's look at one of the challenges right here. So this is where Tesla supercharges at. You are talking about 130 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt of power. This is where we want to get to. Will and I, you know, extremely fast charging. Well, this we are talking about you know, 300, 350 kilowatt of uh, power coming, coming in. Well, Tesla will say, well, 40 minutes or so, I will get you somewhere, probably 80%. Here we want to do 15 minutes to get there. But, but along the way, there's so many challenges. Number one is you just keep pushing electrons and lithium in and out so fast, you're going to build up inside the batteries of this concentration gradient of lithium. So how do you handle that, promote the lithium ion transport? And also, for each of these material, lithium coming in and out through liquid electrolyte into your solid state, you know, and liquid electrolyte, lithium carry this solvent molecule called solvation shell. You know, lithium needs to take off the clothes in order to go in. Taking off the clothes takes energy. Take, it is a resistance right there. You want lithium to be naked very fast. How do you do that, right? This is a challenge we try to solve. And also inside a battery, when you do charging in fast charging, and then you are going to generate a lot of heat in the middle of the batteries. The outside will dissipate the heat fast, but the inside will be very hot. You're going to have a temperature gradient right there. I mean, if you, you are a mechanical engineer, you look at this, well, sounds familiar. That's heat, right? That's transport. If you're a material science looking at this, you say, well, a chemist, you say, well, this sounds familiar. You know, if you're a chemical engineering student, you say, wow, now mass transfer or mechanical engineering, this sounds familiar. So it requires many different types of background come together to solve this type of issue. So we have a few ideas how to do that. So, but I probably won't have time to, to go into the detailed ideas, and I will skip that. But at last, let me just show you one example before I you know, hand the podium to, uh, to Will. We need new tools to understand what's inside the batteries. We really need new tools. Um, you know, all these batteries material, many of them, they are not stable. If you want to look at them, for example, using electron mic microscopy, you are going to destroy them 
destroy them really fast. They are really not stable under the beam. They are not stable chemically. They react with oxygen, with air, with water. And it's painful. It's painful. But we do need to understand, down to atomic scale, what's happening if you have the battery charging and discharging. So several years ago, three years ago, we developed this technique. And with two graduate students right there. Um, and in 2016, we actually borrowed a technique we learned from biologists. Uh, that's the cryogen electron microscopy. That was the Nobel Prize winning technique in 2017. And uh, bi structural biologists use uh, liquid nitrogen or liquid ethane, really cold, to stabilize their protein molecules to solve the structure of the protein uh, down to, like, say, two angstrom resolution. So there's several major advancements right there. You know, cold, being cold, stabilize your sample. And also the direct electron detector. That can detect nearly every single electron coming from your sample during imaging. So you don't have to expose your sample for too long. The dosage is very small. Then you can get the structure information. And there's also computational power to solve 3D structure of protein. So we borrow some of this technique. It's a very collaborative place at Stanford right here. I remember when I started this project, I went talk to Professor Roger Kornberg. I asked Roger's you know, the group to help us to uh, really start this uh, technique. We knew nothing about cryo-EM. So now we develop a technique. We could see uh, this is metallic lithium. You know, lithium is a really light element. A lithium low melting point in the past, there's no way to obtain atomic scale resolution of lithium metal. Now it's possible. Now you see these beautiful images right there. We obtain atomic column of lithium right there. And uh, it turned out to be this paper come out in science in 2017. It took nine months to reveal. That's my uh, record of the longest reveal time of my paper. Guess what? Because when we show this image to reviewers, reviewers couldn't believe you can see lithium metal, atomic scale resolution. That's because lithium metal is not stable. Now it is the cryo EM technique. And if you talk to biologists, they believe right away because they can see protein. Look at lithium metal, it's trivial. But if you actually talk to material scientists, it's actually much harder. So now a uh, number of groups can really see this now. So, so everybody starts to believe in it. So not only that, using a tool like this, we solve about a 30, 40 year old puzzle. What's the interfacial structure on your lithium battery materials? That can show how fast, right? Lithium coming in and going out to a certain degree, determining the fast charging to a certain degree. And these two models of structure proposed, so-called solid electrolyte interface, this SEI, but turned out to be, it's not like what people propose. After we could see this under cryogenic electron microscopy, this is a lithium metal. This 20 nanometer thick is the interfacial layer of SEI. And this consists of inorganic grain embedded into amorphous matrix, different from what people think. This is using the electrolyte. This is a carbonate electrolyte. If you know a little bit about the battery, you know each battery company have the secret ingredient of the electrolyte. They add an additive. This one and that one, just like cooking. You know, certain chef can cook you really good food, but you don't know what's the secret ingredient in there. That's the, the state, the status of the battery industry. So after you add in this one of the secret in, ingredients right there, what turned out to be not a secret anymore, it's fluorinate con, containing fluorine in this molecule. This whole SEI structure, interfacial structure, completely changed, become multi-layer. This is beautiful inorganic coating on the surface. And then we use the cryo-EM technique combined with electrochemistry. We can correlate one structure, give you a better battery performance. The other one is bad. So this correlation of structure with performance will be very important down the road for us to design the best batteries. You know, I, call, I, call, I really hope to have uh, you know, forever batteries never die. And let's see whether that's possible through this type of understanding. So I think I will jump to the end. I'll give you a number of examples already. Uh, so we are very focused on the battery research. And uh, we know this is important to the industry. We also know this is full of very exciting scientific problems. And we'll be, be continue doing that for a long time. Um, I better just stop right here.
Well, maybe I'll take a couple questions before I let you take over the podium. Any questions from you guys? Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it's very interesting. So you've shown us you you can make all sorts of different uh, shapes uh, for your um, uh, anodes. Uh, I was just wondering, um, what other kinds of sh like what kinds of shapes uh, can you actually make, um, and what sorts of advantages might they have? Yeah, uh, you are probably referred to the silicon. Yes. Silicon has a uh, we made twelve generation. They all look. Beautiful. By the way, they are functional as well, not only beautiful, right? Um, so uh, battery has many problems. The, the uh, materials expansion and breaking. Once expand, the interface is not stable. So for addressing this problem, we have to design the right material to, you know, uh, to solve this problem. So that's a 10 years, more than 10 years of effort. So we we'll learn about all these problems step by step. So each generation, we decide different shape to solve those problems. Eventually, we also find out we need it to be low cost. And we also need to design, use the right structure for the low cost. So that's the motivation why we have so many different shapes. If you're asking me what's the best shape right there, I cannot tell you yet, you know, because the whole industry need to look at that. They need to get the cost to work out, manufacturability to work out, then they really understand, the other people understand what eventually the shape will win. Uh, for me, I have my favorite shape. It's my number 12 generation, if you look at that. The last one, <laughs> that's my ideal shape. I think it accumulates all the features right there to solve the problem, yet at the same time, low cost. Hello, uh, just a quick question. I was just looking through the um, topics of your research. I was wondering, do you also work with a um, lithium air battery, for example? I did for about six months, uh, but I didn't publish any papers on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a really exciting topic. Uh, I decided not to uh, do lithium air. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I don't have good enough idea in that area, so I decided not to. That's, uh, but some other people might do. I, I think this is a really interesting research area. Um, hi, this, yeah. thank you. This is a really cool talk. Um, just wondering, you mentioned about the heat problem. Uh, could you share a bit about like the research uh, or some directions that you're currently working on to, to solve the, the heat yeah. issue? So, let me tell you, once you have the heat problem, what will come, right? What's the problem you have to, to do? If you have temperature uh, gradients inside your battery, the hotter side, any side chemical reaction will happen faster. And the colder side, right, will happen slower. That's one outcome. That's more of the kinetics. This also recently we discovered there's a lot more implication beyond that that can damage the health of the batteries. Uh, the understanding really, really new, not published yet, right? So we see that that can induce a thermal uh, dynamic uh, potential shift of the electrochemical reaction. That has a uh, even bigger implication to the battery's health condition. Then how do I solve that? So I don't have a direct idea yet. We are still brainstorming together. I brainstorm with my students every subgroup meeting. We try to come up. That's part of the fun. I know I don't have an idea right now, but uh, sounds like you know if I continue brainstorm for the next two weeks, two months, <laughs> maybe two years, I might have something coming up. So I, I don't know yet. I don't know at this moment how to solve all this problem, but we are trying. That's the beauty about research. That's also the beauty about coming to graduate sc school. You don't know what's ahead. I know it's exciting. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, apart from looking for alternatives for cobalt, what 
uh, would you suggest are other ways by which we can drive down the cost of batteries? Yeah. So, uh, well, it's a lithium ion, right? Now, a lithium ion case, you want to use less of cobalt or no cobalt. Maybe in the future, still less nickel. Uh, well, I think Professor Chen will probably can tell you a little bit, can mention at least a little bit, he's uh, working along that direction. So my group is trying to do sulfur. Because sulfur will be also high energy, uh, but no expensive stuff. Sulfur is very low cost. However, sulfur is very difficult. I've been doing that for 10 years right now, still has no full confidence yet this will, will work. Okay, um, Professor, one question. I remember the silicon in the solar cell is very fragile. And, oh, okay, and, and but it is in the sand is very uh, rigid. Yeah, I remember lithium and iron, lithium dendrite is something, uh, is something that would penetrate the material. So is it good to find a soft material to store the lithium and prevent the possible uh, leakage problem? Yeah, so you say sil yeah, silicon is brittle. Uh, you know, a solar cell, a silicon wave, a whole single crystal, you break it easily. Um, for the batteries case, not single crystal, it's individual small particle. So in terms of brittleness, that problem is, I think it's gone. But the problem is lithium coming in, silicon particle, each one expand four times, roughly in that range. That break the materials. That's the challenge. And then you ask the question, you know, whether we want to find the soft materials. I think soft material to store lithium has its a, a benefit. The processability, mechanical flexibility is good. There's value on that. One example is using polymer, using organic materials. I mean, indeed, that's a direction Professor Bao and chemical engineering and my group, we work closely together to develop a new type of organics to store charge for the electro. That's a really exciting direction. I have zero minutes left. Maybe I'll take one last question. And it's because uh, she already has the uh, microphone. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'll try to make this quick, but this is slightly a different uh, angle. So you mentioned it's very, very hard to take it to market or your research. And you're clearly wearing multiple hats um, between a researcher and also an entrepreneur yourself. So just curious, how do you toggle between these different roles? And what do you see as the biggest challenges? Yeah, the biggest challenge is time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> When you're debating, you want to get more sleep or wake up to work. I mean, every day, right? Until now, you know, 40, 43 years, I've been debating that. Maybe the first year of my life, I didn't how know how to think. I didn't debate, but uh, 42. Uh, so, yeah, uh, my function in the company, I founded the company. I'm sitting in the board of director, chairman of the board, but I never take any office or title in the company. So I spent one day per week. I told the company, I mean, that's the maximum I could spend. That's also the maximum amount Stanford allowed me to spend. So, so I did that. I told investors about that, they're okay. So but when you're smart about your time management, I think this is uh, doable. This is doable. I have a really great team, great CEO to run the company. That's the only way this can happen. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Well, while Will is setting up, let me introduce him. <laughs> By the way, we didn't talk beforehand how to introduce each other, so we were just... Uh, uh, we're joining faculty for six years now, roughly? Seven. Seven. Oh, yeah, I still remember when you were a baby assistant professor, now already. <laughs> <laughs> My God. So Will got tenure this year, by the way. I mean, he's a superstar. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's very clear the first day he stepped onto Stanford campus, we met with him. We say, this is the person we want to bring it onto Stanford campus to be a faculty. Very clear superstar from day one. I think when you come to Stanford to interview, you have not graduated from Caltech yet. You, you were still a graduate student. So 
that could be achieved. This is an example right there. So past seven years, he has been doing amazing work. Completely open everybody's eye. You know, I work on Barry for a long time. When we started to work on Barry, I got the idea. Um, <clears throat> He come up. I never thought about. It. I said, "Well, this is just amazing. You know, solving major problem." He's probably going to tell you one or two today. You will be impressed. As I said, if I were grad student once, I would join his group as a graduate student. He didn't buy me lunch or anything. You know, I mean, that's truly coming from here. With that, we'll. So that was an implanted question. So today I want to talk a little bit about accelerating the pace of R&D for batteries. So if we, E and I, convince all of you to contribute your time and effort toward realizing energy storage that is inexpensive and abundant, that would be a hundred person year worth of research for the next five years or so. But if you look at the scale of the problem, lithium-ion battery, just lithium-ion battery alone, will go from a $50 billion industry to $1 trillion in the next 15 years. So the pace of R&D is very much rate limiting. I'm going to tell you what the limiting factors are and what we are doing at Stanford in particular, trying to accelerate the pace of R&D by intersecting artificial intelligence and batteries. I'm a material scientist. This is all very new to me. But I am motivated by the fact that we can do maybe not 100 person year worth of research in the next five years, but 1,000 person year by accelerating the pace. So battery is kind of a funny technology. It has several characteristics. One, a good battery lasts a long time. So even the mere simple task of assessing how long a battery is going to last, so if you design a new battery, you want to know it's going to last 20 years or two years. It's going to take 20 or two years to assess that. And batteries are complex. It's like a chemical plant in a small device. So the design space is very large. Often you're dealing with optimizing 50 parameters simultaneously. So E talked about fast rechargeability, energy density, safety, and so forth. Some of the events we're trying to design for are very rare. So we hear about all the bad examples of battery catching on fire, but they are one out of tens of millions of batteries. And then the act of designing, manufacturing, assessing batteries are also very resource intensive. So if you look at all these requirements, it tells us that the goals should be, can we learn and optimize across the design space as quickly as possible? To address the issues of long assessment time, can we make accurate predictions of future outcome? For rare events, can we predict the probability that will happen without having to test 10 million individual devices to have the one failure. And then also we have to somehow balance between the throughput and the accuracy of doing these experiments. So for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work uh, along with computer scientists and engineers at Stanford to look at addressing the issues of the large design space and batteries and also the long assessment time. To give you a few flavors of assessment time, and the type of problems we can solve for a given battery chemistry. So take one of the ones that E had mentioned. You want to be able to charge them quickly. You want to be able to manufacture them quickly because that contributes to cost. And then you want to be able to predict whether the battery is good or not where you're using it, an electric vehicle. All of these problems have a common attribute is the number of parameters it involves. For example, you're dealing with maybe just 10 parameters. Sorry, five parameters, you have 10 values each, you repeat the measurement 10 times, and each repetition you run a thousand cycles, that's roughly a, a lifetime of a modest battery, and this comes out to one billion battery cycles, so it's pretty resource intensive. And there are other problems like R&D pipelines, so if you're engineering a new battery chemistry, you will have to iterate on a daily basis and you have to go through these billion battery cycles. Things like quality insurance during manufacturing, so if you make a new battery, you want to make sure it works well time to time as you produce it. And each time you produce it, you have to wait another 20 years to find out how long it's going to last. Safety prediction I already mentioned. 
So this common challenge is a large hyperdimensional design space with very long assessment time and optimization time. And I think personally this is one of the big limiting factors, just how, many, how much time we have and how many people we have devoted to solving the problem. So I will continue to make the goal to convince all of you to work in this space, but not all of you will work. But those of you who will work with us will try to multiply your effort by a factor of 10 or 100 if possible. For a variable battery chemistry, so now you're in the business of, say, going from one chemistry to another, from one geometry to another, you also have to optimize the chemistry, you have to optimize the synthesis, you have to optimize the design, you have to optimize the manufacturing, exactly the same thing. So what I want to talk about today is something that we have been working on for the past five years. Um, and this is looking at a way to optimize and learn about battery design space in a closed loop manner. Uh, a fancy way to view this is autonomous optimization of batteries. So the way it looks, it works is as follows. You start with some process, right? So it could be making the new battery chemistry. Then you would assess the battery chemistry by charging and discharging the battery, mimicking the functionality of an electric vehicle, for example. Then in the second box there, you want to be able to predict the future outcome without having to actually perform all those experiments. So can we predict the 2,000th cycle behavior of the battery using just the first five cycles? This will require some training data. And once you have the ability to predict the future behavior, then you can explore the design space. Here, this is just a simple 4x4x4 four by four by four design cube okay, for three parameters. But in actuality, this could be a 50-dimensional space with maybe 10 or 20 blocks along each axis. So very quickly, the problem becomes intractable. So you have to be able to pick the right cube to test. So you have to hone in on the right part of the design space to focus on the ones that will work and to make repetition where the statistics count. And then you want to iterate the entire thing. So now with some idea how the design space is laid out, you do a second iteration, a 20th iteration, a 200th iteration of the cycle, and slowly but surely you modify your materials, your process, in order to achieve the objective. And that could be, for example, to charge a battery faster or to decrease the manufacturing time. And my talk has two parts. The first part is the ability to predict the future behavior batteries accurately. And to do that, uh, a number of students and postdocs in my group, and then we have one sitting in this room as well who has already committed to solving this problem of energy storage, we have the Stanford Battery Informatics Lab, which has the ability to test about 600 batteries simultaneously. So if you think about this as a parallel multi-node data generation, this is about as best as it gets because batteries are rather small and we can parallel process them uh, in, in an efficient manner. So those of you interested can take a look at these facilities. So we're testing hundreds of batteries at a time. And we're able to generate a data cube that is actually rather large. This data cube here is about 400 million data points. So we took about 100 batteries. We charge and discharge them in a variety of ways. We record temperature, voltage, resistance, current over time. Okay? So along the three axes, we have basically the cycle of the battery, the capacity of the battery, and the voltage of the battery. And we're able to record that. So the objective initially is, can we predict the future behavior of the battery with very limited data. So if you take a look at this cycling behavior, so the y-axis is basically the capacity, and the x-axis is the cycle number. So you want the line to be as flat as possible, to be as close to 100% as possible. So those are the battery that's well behaving. It lasts maybe 3,000 cycles. So that will translate to close to a million miles driven on an electric car. So that's very desirable. But not all batteries behave like that. Some batteries behave very poorly. So they may only have 1,000 cycle in lifetime or even just 200. Now, if I zoom in on just the first 100 cycle, OK, so that's just the first 10% of this plot, and say, ignore the rest, can I predict the behavior of the battery on which one's going to last a long time, which one will last just briefly? The color are coded in such a way that blue is short lifetime and red is long lifetime. And if you look at the first 100 cycles, so this is blown up 10x, you can see there's no order in the line. The only thing I can predict is this one here, that this is really poor. But between red and green and blue on the top, I can't really tell. 
So simply by looking at how the capacity of the battery degrades, it's not sufficient. And if I do a rigorous statistical analysis, I can see that the cycle life has very weak correlation with the performance at the 100th cycle. And also, if you look at the slopes of the degradation rate, there's also very weak correlations, almost a straight line, which means there's no correlation in this case. So that means whatever the degradation mechanism it is, the thing we're trying to predict is very silent. Okay, so it doesn't show up until it shows up. So this is a very challenging problem. And what we thought to do is rather than just using this capacity curve, each data point here also contains about 10,000 data points on voltage and current and temperature versus time. So why don't we look at one level deeper? And when we do that, we're able now to follow basically not just the evolution of the battery capacity, so that's the runtime of the battery, but also the change and the subtle change in the voltage of the battery as a function of time for each charge and discharge cycle you do. And that's plotted there. The green is the difference between two cycles, in this case between cycle 10 and 100. And we ran a very simple machine learning exercise using a methodology called elastic net. This is you know, 20 years old, nothing fancy. But we take the 10th and the 100th cycle, so just two cycles, and we train the model to predict the lifetime all the way out to 2,500. And we're able to achieve a level of prediction, just using 100 batteries, of around 10%. Okay? So that means we can predict with 90% confidence what is the battery's lifetime by just recording this amount of data. So this will then translate on average into a saving of 15x just by not having to cycle the battery to failure. So you might say, well, 100 cycle, that's still quite a bit. That's still a couple of days to run. And in the factory, you don't have the luxury of cycling 100 times just because you're eating 100 times into the battery cycle life. So can we do it just with five cycles? So then we change the objective a little bit. Rather than predicting the lifetime of the battery, I just want to predict whether the battery will be good or bad. If it's good, I will proceed. If it's bad, I will stop. This is called a classification problem. So once we pose the problem this way, our algorithm is able to predict with 95% accuracy whether it's a good battery or bad battery. And I define that as a battery with below 550 cycles or above 550 cycles. And this kind of classification problem, I think you can see, it's going to be very helpful in the hands of graduate students. Because now when you make a new battery, rather than waiting until the end of your PhD to know if it worked or not, you can know within a few days. But there would be a probability, right? It's not for sure, but you can say 95% confidence this is not going to work. So I will move on. So I think this will be a tool liked by many of you as well. Things in the red box are good. Things in the, uh, in the green box are good. So these are basically the correct predictions. So these are batteries that actually doesn't last a long time. And we predict not to last a long time. And the green is the vice versa. So anything outside is a bad prediction. So basically one out of 100 specimen we could not predict correctly. So I think this is rather good. And overall, the theme here is we generate the data. We learn from the data, which is what I presented. And then I will finish up at the end of the talk to how we can rationalize it. Because we learn something, but this trend has a physical meaning. So far, no physics has been imparted to the problem. But before I get into that, I want to talk about the design of experiments. So we show that it is possible to reduce the time of experiment by maybe 15x by just not having to run the battery to failure by predicting with statistical relevance the future behavior of the battery. But this still doesn't solve any problem because this is not an optimization problem. The optimization problem comes in the third block here where I'm trying to choose the best block out of that 4x4x4 four by four by four space and say, what is the best way to do a certain task involving a battery? And I want to iterate it and basically hone in on the right answer as quickly as possible. And I think Eve gave a great introduction on the necessity to increase our battery charging time. So the biggest, one of the biggest obstacles for battery deployment in the electric vehicle is the difference between charging versus refueling time. So refueling time is typically about six minutes currently and can be faster. And battery charging time for the same range is about 70 minutes. So if you can design something that can charge in 10 minutes, 
this will increase the rate of adoption for an electric vehicle. And the problem is very well suited for the optimization task at hand. Let me define the problem for you. So we have chosen the battery chemistry, and we're asking what is the best way to deliver 80% of the energy in 10 minutes? So there are many ways, actually infinite number of ways to deliver it. For example, you can do it really quickly initially and then taper it down. That's how Tesla does it. You can also maybe start low, go high, and go back down again, or you can do the reverse. So this is basically the optimization of the charging profile. How do you vary voltage and current with time? And this picture here depicts it. This is current versus time. Okay, so it has five individual steps, and you can arrange the step in many different ways to satisfy the constraint of being 10 minutes. Okay? So the various lines I show there are the various possible values that will add up to 10 minutes at the end. On the right is the visualization of the design space. We chose 200 possible combination of these lines over here. Okay? There are various time and voltage versus time, um, current and voltage versus time. And our goal is to identify the statistically best 10-minute charging protocol as quickly as possible. Benchmark, if we do a grid search, which means we carefully examine each one of them with a triplicate measurement, will take 500,000 battery cycles. If I'm able to test 50 batteries at the same time, this will take 600 days. So roughly about 50% of your PhD thesis. Um, so the, my student, Peter Atiyah, who was working on this, said, no way, we're not going to do this for two years. So that was a personal motivation for him to do this faster. So what we're really doing here in the machine learning world is active learning. So how do we learn this design space, hone in on the correct part of the space that delivers the best 10 minute, which is classified as giving the highest cycle life? I won't get into the details of the algorithm, but this is the outcome. We start with 50 experiments at a time. So we do it four different times. So it's 50 times four. Initially, the 50 experiments are spread out uh, randomly in the design space. So we get a sense of what the design space looks like. This is the act of exploration. But then as we explore, we also record and predict what is the lifetime of the battery. And this is incorporating the early prediction I showed in the first part of the talk. So basically, within 100 cycles, I'm predicting cycle life all the way out to 1,200. Okay? Then I iterate it again. But the second time you run it, you can see that the algorithm has honed in on the part of the design space that performs well. And this is called exploitation. So you're exploiting the part of the design space that's worth repeating. So we're now increasing the repetition. Round three, round four, just honing in. And you can see. On the bottom row, the design space emerges. So this is lifetime as a function of the three design parameters. Initially, it's very uniform. But as you go further and further out, it becomes more structured. So this is the objective. I want to learn the design space and focus my efforts on the part that counts. This is the performance metric. This is the number of repetition per design point. Actually, out of the 200 protocols, more than half were never tested because they're not good. So there's no need to waste our resource in testing it. About um, 60 is tested once, and only more, less than uh, 45 are tested more than two times. Okay? And only three were tested four times. So basically, we're focusing on decreasing the error because batteries have very high variabilities by only doing those on the part of the design space, a design space that matters. And then to wrap a bit, these are the result. Okay? These are the top performance in terms of how the current should be ramped with time. So contrary to what Tesla uses, it's actually quite flat, so we're still trying to understand what's going on here. And actually, the worst performer are exactly the one that ramps down. So this was a bit confusing to us. But it's possible without such a design optimization process, it's easy to overlook the really good part of the space because the top is counterintuitive. In the next three minutes, I'm going to tell you how this can be brought to the next level. And this is really at the frontier of the research we do today. So batteries are very multi-link scale devices. If you start with a cylindrical battery like your AA battery or the battery used in a Tesla car, it has maybe 10 watt hours in energy. You zoom in, 
all the way from the device to the particles and then to the atoms, you're spanning more than 12 orders of magnitude in energy and 10 orders of magnitude in time and length. So this is a very difficult problem. And so far, I've only showed you battery cycling at the very top length scale. And E showed this earlier. This is the plot I like to use is to show the type of length and time scale we're able to address from picoseconds to years, from nanometers to meters. And the goal here is basically to see if we can control batteries across scales, not just one of them, but across them. What we need to do here is to embrace other forms of data stream. So, so far I showed you one kind of data stream, which is battery cycling. So those of you familiar with devices, these are device characteristics. Just like a solar cell, I run an IV curve. A battery, I can run a, simp uh, a charge and discharge sequence. But there are other kind of data stream. For example, if I open up the battery, I can use an optical microscope. Look at the scale bar here. This is 10 centimeters, so you can see this with the naked eye. If you look at the micro scale, so the previous speaker showed uh, tomography results um, in geological context, we can do this also in the battery context. So this is now two micron scale bar, and you can see the porosity and the structure of the battery, and the color here represents how many lithium you have in the battery. You can simulate, for example, stress and strain distribution because this is why batteries fail. They have developments of internal stress. We can take one of these particles and then go to one of the particle that makes up it. And then we can go to 500 nanometer scale bar and then observe the dynamics of how the lithium is going in now. So this is a movie showing lithium leaving and entering the material. And then you can also go smaller from, say, 500 nanometer to 2 nanometer by tracking how atoms move around in the lattice. And E showed the electron microscopy image to look at interfaces. So what we have to do, and this is my final slide, is to accelerate the pace of R&D in a budget-constrained world. And budget here is basically the cost per experiment and the number of experiments. And this could be in terms of money, in terms of graduate student time, so on and so forth. So our idea here is to take experiments like device characteristics, which is low fidelity, low cost, go to more high fidelity measurements like average property, mesoscale dynamics, or atomic properties. But as you go down, the number of experiments you can do becomes fewer and fewer. At the same time, the theoretical simulations are the same thing. You can start with device models, which are very simple. You can run them in a fraction of a second. Or you can run these molecular dynamic simulations that will take uh, days or weeks to perform. So you also shrink down the number of experiments. Currently, the way we do things is to approach each one of these boxes independently. Maybe there's pairwise interaction, but there's no effort currently trying to combine all of them at the same time. And what we propose to develop as a fully integrated experiment and simulation planning, so choosing what experiment uh, and what simulation to run, cross interpretation across scales. Okay, so how do we interpret all seven things at a time? Validate and optimize. So I think this can help us to give us that one order of magnitude boost. So taking the 100 person year worth of research in the next five years and maybe multiplying that to 1,000. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what is the industry's perspective of using machine learning and AI for their battery research as you have been applying it? Yeah, they're really looking to us for direction. So we are working with many of the leading industry partners to try to practice this for the type of data they have. But I think machine learning is still viewed as a very high risk direction because it's not certain it's going to work. So the university has the role to demo it, to say it works. An industry can take our 500 nodes experiment and then do so for 50,000 nodes. So there is a demonstration that is needed, and that's precisely our role here, and then to develop the fundamental science behind the methodology, so the codes, the algorithm are all very scalable. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, 
the prediction at the start, the prediction stuff at the start, which was super interesting, was based on differences between um, the charge discharge of a hundred cycles, which um, I think is based on uh, like a given physical configuration um, having some difference, uh, creating some difference, which the model picks up on. Is this um, universal? Would that also change when you have a different, for example, shape as mentioned in the previous talk? Right. So. In principle, you need training data for each new chemistry you're identifying. But I think what you're picking up is basically the degradation mechanism. So that's why there's such a strong trend. I should emphasize there's not just one descriptor. We use 20 different features to predict it. So it's a combination of everything. So as you switch different chemistry, in principle, you will need new training data. But once you encode in some of the physics in chemistry, it may be possible to move chemistry Without, without, say, generating all the training data again. So that's sort of moving toward the direction of incomplete training data. And that's going to be important, too, because you're not going to be able to wait 20 years for your full training data to come in. Yeah. All right, thank you. thanks a lot for the talk. It was a great talk. Um, and you talked about, so in one of your slides, you talked about the um, the charging profiles, the optimization of the charging profiles for good battery life, and you talked about why you didn't understand why Tesla would charge ramp up fast. And I wanted to comment on that because I think from their perspective, they're trying to sell EVs and range anxiety is a thin, and so they want to maximize the battery capacity during that time. And your goal also is to eventually um, help the adoption of EVs. So how do you marry, like, your research with this, like the industry's um, right. perception where they want to sell more cars and help alleviate the range anxiety while you know that the charging profile currently being used isn't right. ideal for the batteries? I think another way to phrase the problem is what is the objective function? So the objective function for us was maximizing lifetime. But the other objective function could be deliver as many coulombs as possible in the first 30 minutes. So properly designing the objective matters a lot. So we don't have the resources to try every single objective out. And what we are trying to do here is to develop the tools, the methods, and the demonstrations that this can work. And industry can take this and incorporate it into their own and choose the objective that matters to them. Right? And each company would have a different objective. And that's the beauty of this, is you can change the objectives very easily. Right? You can have a three front objective, if you like. Thank you for Professor's talk. I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you mentioned the your experiments uh, did for to to predict the two thousand or more the circles. And how I want to know what happened if I want to predict one hundred uh, ten thousand circles. Mm -hmm. Is this still accurate for, to predict for so many and uh, so long times. And the second question is um, from AI or machine learning is results, how, how is this result to um, be connect, be linked with the chemical, uh, uh, the chemical change? I mean, um, how to link the results with the materials change and uh, chemical change? Yeah, that's my two questions. So the first question is a very easy one to answer, but a very difficult one to actually take actions on, is can we predict out to 10,000 cycles? Well, to do so, you have to have validation experiments at 10,000 cycles. And that will take a few years to generate. So I think the not so easy answer is, can we just not validate it? Can we validate it using a combination of modeling? So you can extrapolate using some sort of a mathematical model to 10,000 cycle without testing. If you look at easy example of the Airbus drones, they're supposed to last 10 years in the sky. You're not going to have 10 years to develop the battery and then try it out for another 10 years in the sky. This is not possible. And that's why I'm mentioning this difficult task of accelerating R&D. Because battery just lasts too long. That's the problem. Uh, if they can only last a shorter amount of time, then we don't have to iterate on the 10-year time scale. Uh, the second question is precisely why I showed the other facets of the research we do here, is once the batteries fail, you should take it apart and understand what happens at the interfacial level, at the microstructural level, and 
combining those data streams, for example, these average property atomic characterization, then it will give you a better idea why it's failing. So you're not just learning the design space, you're also learning why the design space is the way that it is. So I think that's the overall goal here. It's not just data. I'm a material scientist, so I want to understand why things are happening. Thank you. Maybe just one last question. I think I'm standing in the way of lunch. Sorry about that. Um, so using machine learning, you typically look for patterns. Oh, so I guess you assume that similar batteries uh, work in similar ways in a continuous fashion. So I was wondering if you run into limits of discontinuities or like, for example, I guess these mm -hmm. kinds of models are not good at uh, predicting uh, rare events or stuff like that. Yeah, so I think again, it has to concern with the type of training data you have, but it's possible here, this is a single degradation mechanism. Basically, it tells you that our data only has one predictable mechanism, but if you get two lines out, then there could be a bimodal degradation mechanism. So I think if your data set is large enough, you will be able to tease apart different kinds of mechanism, but it does increase the cost of having more training data. And this comes back to the theme at the very end is, at some point, you need physics and chemistry. Without it, you don't know how the two mechanisms are related or not related. So the future goal is really to incorporate, and this is what we're doing right now, is to incorporate the right amount of physics, the right amount of chemistry, and then merge that with the vast amount of data that we have access to and join them in a holistic manner. Thank you. All right, with that, thank you very much and enjoy lunch. Thank you.